Operations Manager at John Lewison Partners, which means I've got um, overall accountability for the smooth running of the JohnLewis.com website. And I consider myself a new boy. This, uh, w but this very week will be my 20th anniversary working at John Lewis. Um, and throughout my career, I've been an on-call programmer, I've been a technical architect, I've led ops teams. <coughs> Um, I've also uh, <coughs> led the uh, implementation of ITIL and service management and change management, <laughs> but please don't hold that against me. Hello, I'm Steve Smith. Um, I'm a principal consultant, Equal Experts, have been for seven years, and I recently spent two and a half years working at John Lewis and Partners with Simon and some other great folks. If you're looking for somewhere to work, uh, believe me, John Lewis and Partners is a great place to work. We won't do too much. Thanks for the plug, Steve. Um, so we're here to talk about operability and you build it, you run it at John Lewis and Partners. And this is how we've gone from 10 big releases a year to over 5,000 deployments in a year. But also, importantly, while, whilst improving the website stability at the same time. But first, let me give you a little bit of background to John Lewis. Hopefully most of you have heard of us and a little bit of context of the retail market. So this is definitely not John Lewis, but anybody old enough like me may recognise this as How You've Been Served, which is a 70s and 80s kind of uh, uh, sitcom. But actually, our history goes back much, much further than that. So our heritage dates back all the way back to 1864, where John Lewis Sr. opened his first store in Oxford Street, which is still there, a lot bigger than it used to be. <laughs> but he was actually, and pictured here, it was his son, John Speeden Lewis, who really is the founder of our business model. So he believed in fairness and humanity, and he experimented with a very different business model. Because he thought the three owners earning more than all of the 300 employees was not fair. And way back in 1920, he was the first one to create this co-ownership model and shared the first bonus of seven weeks pay for, for every single employee, which was you know, a, huge, a huge thing. This now means our 78,000 employees, or we call ourselves partners, are all co-owners in our business. Uh, we share in the profits, but uh, you, know, you have to make profit to be able to do that. So that's what we're trying to, trying to do. So the, the partnership, the Unleashed Partnership, is the overarching brand. We've got two uh, brands within that. Uh, hopefully many of you will know the John Lewis Department Stores. Um, and also our Waitrose shops um, of, of supermarkets, grocers. Uh, I did note that um, Tesco's tried to sabotage us coming here by crashing into the railway line bridge on the way down, but yeah. I will hold it against them. Um, and these strong foundations <laughs> have still allowed us to adapt and innovate. You see uh, Edgar, Eager Edgar the dra Dragon, uh, we've now got a traditional Christmas advert which is uh, often uh, heralded as the official start of Christmas. But, uh, you know, something like that was trending number one on UK Twitter within two minutes of launch and, and, and adapting with the likes of social media is really, really key to survival. But uh, our stores, as you'll see from many years ago, continue to adapt and, and uh, be updated with much more experience-led uh, uh, environments here. And indeed, they've had to change. So looking back, all the way back to 2019, not that long ago, very challenging year with retail. You know, big brands like Mothercare disappearing from the high street back then. Unbelievably, Brexit, does anybody remember that? That was just like everything that everybody was talking about. And then along came coronavirus, and everything changed it again. And we've lost high street black brands like Debenhams and House of Fraser. And if you see the stat on the right there, almost 10,000 stores, high street stores, have closed in 2020. So it's been tough for all of us in retail, it's been tough for John Lewis too, but let's look at some positives. Oops, that's not very positive, but we'll get there, I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, so here's a great example of how we quickly adapted or quickly pivoted. Um, we were able to launch virtual services just two weeks after the first lockdown when we were forced to close all our stores. So virtual nursery, personal, personal styling, home design, beauty classes, all proved hugely popular and continue to prove popular. So we think these things will last on beyond uh, the coronavirus period. Coronavirus has also certainly accelerated our 
move to online, to digital. So johnleaves.com was already pretty successful. We uh, already were about 40% of the sales compared to 60% in the, in the John Lewis shops. This is now running at about 60% online versus 40% in the shops, and we expect that to continue probably around a 60 to 70%. Um, there's a graph here just uh, showing the Black Friday, so I said a huge trading period for us. And normally that is our big day by biggest day by about 10, a factor of 10 compared to any other day. But obviously last year was slightly different. All our shops were shut uh, when we launched Black Friday. So we had to be ready and we certainly did, well, we got the estimates right, we had a 50% increase in sales on that day compared to the previous year, which was huge. Uh, fortunately, I'm pleased to say that the last three years of investment paid off. Platform scaled perfectly uh, and through Throughout Black Friday and the whole period, we, we had stability, uh, which is absolutely critical these days, and we traded without any issues. So, let's go back in time and have a look at 2017, which was a cri cri uh, critical decision point for us on our journey. So in 2017, we felt our speed to market of new features was too slow. The technology was something that was constraining us rather than what it should be doing, which is enabling the business. We also found it really difficult to manually scale all our, our on-premise -prem servers. Uh, you know, for the likes of Black Friday, we had to scale up and, and that was really slow and difficult to do. And also scaling in a different way to add more teams was really difficult. Um, and we were facing a key <coughs> decision point as well. So we we're about to walk into, do we spend the majority of our budget for the next 18 months upgrading our monolithic commercial off-the-shelf e-commerce package which would just enable us to stay in support and add no new customer features or not. I'm not going to give any prizes for guessing which way we went. So, back then we had six teams working on actually multiple kind of monoliths. There were some third party commerce packages, but we also had accidentally uh, written some of our own bespoke front ends that were monolithic as well. We had one central operations team called Application Operations Support that mostly comprised of a third party managed service with some partners as well. We managed at that time just one overnight deploy a month and then when we take into account change freezes that just meant 10 deploys over a year. And these were big, huge, you know, scary releases, caused plenty of major incidents, um, created kind of quality issues. And you know, we felt we were losing millions in, in lost opportunity costs and we couldn't release features fast enough. So next, let's now talk about how we tackle those changes. So this is a timeline and a very brief narrative of a huge amount of work by a lot of people. And we can't cover everything, so I'll just cover a few key points here. So late in 2017, we made a commitment to replace our monoliths with digital services while still delivering new features to customers. Those services, we um, created them to run on what we call the John Lewis Digital Platform. It's, in Netflix terms, uh, a paved road. It's a bespoke platform and capabilities are built on top of the Google Cloud Platform. So this has allowed us to scale up the product teams without compromising on throughput quality or reliability. And by Black Friday 2018, our cloud search team were our pioneering team and they'd got to 1% of live traffic to, to prove it. Now, this validated not only the technology would work and the platform and the service running on top of it, but also the ways of working as well. If you want to hear any more about that, then some of my colleagues are presenting here at, uh, in this uh, uh, place at uh, 1.45 tomorrow, so please uh, join them for that. Going forward to uh, Black Friday 2019, we had nine times as, times as many teams on the platform. We had the product teams on call, so they were really building it and running it, and new cost, uh, customer propositions were emerging. And by 2020, we continued to grow, accelerate, moving significant amounts of traffic away from the monoliths, um, and as you saw, we had record levels of Black Friday traffic. So back in 2017, we believed that product teams and you build it, you run it were prerequisites for daily deployments and higher reliability. 
But you know what, back in the 2000s, we actually had online <coughs> delivery and ops teams. So haven't we done this before? And we ended up having to split them out and you know, splitting out the disciplines of delivery and operations. But, but what happened? What caused that? I mean, essentially, we ended up with too many operational issues and it became too overwhelming and that may, meant that we missed the delivery deadlines. So what's different this time and what can we learn from that? So back then, we had project-based delivery with infrequent business owner input. They would just come along at the end of the quarter and go, you shouldn't have done that. As we all know, hopefully you're in agile product teams and that's our answer to that with a product owner on a daily basis helping with the prioritization it makes a big, big difference. Also back then we had manual testing and that didn't catch enough defects. So now we've got automated testing, continuous integration. Our releases were infrequent, large, manual. <coughs> we now have continuous delivery with small, frequent deployments. And also, our on-premise test and live environments were far too different, different and slow to provision from the, the, the kind of test environments. So we now have this digital platform with cloud-based self-service infrastructure. Um, I mean, back then it used to take us, what, six months to, from requesting it to build a, a, an environment and get it live. We can do that in one day now, so a huge difference. But all of those things together has made such a big difference. But when it came to operability, so keeping the availability high and the operational issues low, the question I kept asking myself and Steve was, how do you embed operability into digital teams at scale in an organization that's 150 years old. So we broke this down into four main areas. So growing awareness, making product teams responsible for supporting live digital services so they could feel any pain that they caused and address it quickly. Identifying concerns, so standardizing and then visualizing both leading and trailing indicators. And don't worry, Steve will go on to explain some of this in more detail in a second. Testing proficiency by running chaos days and doing live load tests in-house on a frequent basis. And also embedding principles such as creating new learning pathways and opportunities for our employees, our partners. So now I'll hand over to Steve and he can give you a little bit more information about some of this. Steve. Thank you. So, an operating model ensures uh, business outcomes. Uh, at Equal Experts, we would say that you build it, you run it as an insurance policy that can achieve high standards of deployment throughput and service reliability uh, in a way that's cost effective. Now, this table, isn't it amazing to have like a laser pointer again? I remember those days where we had laser pointers, uh, 2019. So, uh, this table here, uh, it shows the John Lewis and Partners availability levels. Now the way this works is a product manager reads the onboarding guide for the uh, digital platform, which includes a version of this table. They then input into a spreadsheet um, the estimated revenue per hour for their planned digital service. And then from that, they receive an automatically calculated availability level, uh, one of these, and from that, they're told their on-call level. Now the most important part of that process is it is a product manager that makes the decision here, not a platform operations manager um, such as um, Simon or a platform lead such as myself. The product manager is the budget holder. They make the prioritization decisions. It's for them to say how much on-call their service needs. And the calculator, the table, that's what gives them the help to make that uh, uh, decision. So for example, if a product manager can link a search service to 800,000 pounds, let's say, of online revenue per hour, that would match to a potential loss of 570,000 pounds and 43 minutes. We're dividing 60 into 43 there. So then 570,000 in 43 minutes, that would give them an availability target here of 99.9%. .9%. That's the highest availability level at John Lewis and Partners. And then that means they have a team rotor for on call. So there's no guessing games. There's no inventing, oh, I want to be 99.9 because .9 I'm special. I've got this particular reason. It's all based off revenue, and it's, which ties back to you know, your product planning. Alternatively, we might have, let's say, a merchandise service, and that might be estimated to take in £50,000 an hour in revenue. In that case, then, the availability level would be here, because that's £50,000 in less than seven hours, and that's 99.0%, and then that means there is no on-call for that product out of hours. 
Now, this is a really good framework, we believe, for reasoning about revenue versus availability versus on-call, but it is not a recipe for all organizations. Kevlin, in his keynote today, had um, a great quote. He said, a framework is half an application. Uh, the framework here really is half of what you need. The uh, maximum revenue that you tie to an availability level, like this number here, um, the availability levels you actually want to choose, these ones, and the revenue bands themselves, that's something that you have to figure out for yourself because it's all based on your business and your own context. Uh, for example, the initial revenue levels that we have here, they actually came from a partnership-wide policy that we dug out based around instant management, and then we've adapted that to suit to our own purposes. All right, now this diagram shows uh, instant notification workflows for the johnlewis.com website. Uh, there are two flows here. At the top, we're showing uh, the monoliths and how instant management works there. And in the bottom, we're showing how it works for digital services. And in particular, we're going to see how you build it, you run it, integrate into enterprise service management as is. So the top workflow uh, has an alert for a monolith that's fired out of New Relic, and that goes to a person in the OpsBridge team who are on L1 support. And they have a spreadsheet with a list of on-call people from the uh, application operations team that Simon mentioned earlier. You might just call that the ops team in your company. So the on-call engineer from that team is paged. Um, and a major instant manager is also paged, and they're invited into a Google chat room for instant response, and then somebody manually creates a ServiceNow record, as that's the system of truth within John Lewis and Partners. Now, the bottom workflow here shows an alert for a digital service out of JLDP. That could be New Relic for front-end or Prometheus for microservices. The alert goes into the instant response tool, which is PagerDuty. Uh, that could also be VictorOps or any other tool that you like. The tool itself isn't important, just because PagerDuty is great doesn't mean that there aren't alternatives. So the way that it works then is that PagerDuty automatically creates a record in ServiceNow and there's bi-directional sync. So any updates in PagerDuty or in ServiceNow are automatically reflected in the other direction. Um, a public incident channel is created in Slack, so like INC-123456. And uh, there's a rotor in there managed by the team themselves and the on-call person is automatically paged. And that on-call engineer uh, can actually also contact their major instant manager if they want to. We've created, um, uh, it's called a response plan page duty. There's a big button that says declare a major incident. And the major incident managers are on their own rotor in page duty, so they get contacted. Now, um, when we kind of did this diagram, Simon, uh, in, uh, in preparation for this talk, Simon made the observation that adding page duty into the alerting tool chain was a really important part of the operability journey at John Lewis and Partners. So it had a number of key advantages. Um, do I mean advantages or outcomes? Outcomes. So the time to acknowledge an alert uh, was shrunk from between five to 20 minutes to 60 seconds. Um, with the OpsBridge team, with the best will in the world, like it takes time to rummage through spreadsheets and find the right person and phone them. With PagerDuty, it's all automated, it all happens for you. It also meant that painful friction points around PagerDuty setup and ServiceNow setup could be eliminated for teams because we added it all onto the paved road. It's all fully automated out of JLDP. When you create a new service on JLDP, you just say, I'm 99.9 .9 or I'm 99.5, and JLDP provisions PagerDuT and ServiceNow for you. More importantly, uh, this approach meant that we could demonstrate a commitment to working with all aspects of IT operations, because the major instant manager process is incorporated as is. Um, you may have heard of a company called Forrester Research, and. Um, uh, a very astute analyst that they have, a guy called Charles Betts, who thinks a lot about um, modern infrastructure and operations. Uh, we spoke to him a while ago at Equal Experts about this approach we take to digital service management. And one of his first questions was, how does major instant management work? Because that's a really big problem to solve. And I really disappointed him by saying, uh, it's not a big problem. <laughs> we just work with them as is, and we adapt to the tools to fit their process so it's really comfortable for them. And there's another really subtle little thing here that's really nice, which is um, the Slack instant channel is public. I remember really insisting on that quite strongly, because then that means that anybody can observe an incident and learn from it, and all the information later on is searchable. Um, I think um, more recently, thanks to Simon, that a lot of the process here for the monolith is gradually moving down into a similar workflow, which is testament to how that new process works. OK. so. This visualization shows how out of our support for digital services works at John Lewis and Partners. This example is from early 2020. Uh, the y-axis here is the availability target. You might remember those were the numbers we had, 95.0 up to 99.9. .9. 
and the x-axis is product demand, which I've simplified down to high demand and low demand. Now, we said previously that different digital services have different on-call levels for you build it, you run it, and that's intentional. Um, whenever people say to me, you build it, you run it, can't scale, because 20 people and 20 teams would have to be paid, um, I get a little bit sad, because that's not true. At the same time, we don't want to have one person on call for 20 digital services, because then we're creating another ops team, we're creating another person in the middle who's going to burn out and be unable to handle everything all the time. So what we need to do is we need to find a balance between on-call costs and operability incentives. We want to make sure that engineers on a product team have the maximum incentives to care about operability, despite their maybe previous companies where they've just been like, you must do more features for me now. So if you have a low availability target, which at John Lewis is 95.0, and again, remember, it's all calculated for you. You can't really game it. Uh, so like the branch shop services here, they've got low product demand and then 95.0. They have no on-call out of hours. And when I say no on out of hours, I mean there's no ops team. The system has been designed so they can't, like, you know, come on, ops team, like, sort me out. Um, no, what happens is if they have a problem with their service out of hours, it stays there until the morning. And when the engineers come in, they have to fix it themselves. So the developers have a lot of incentives, even though they're not on call out of hours, to make sure that the service won't break out of hours. So they might put in circuit breakers, for example. Um, they might put um, a cache in front of a database or something like that. OK, so even though they're not on call out of hours, we're just really trying to maximize their incent those incentives. Now, if a digital service has like a middling availability target, which would be around, you know, like 99.5%, um, the way that works is that an engineer from a team might be on call or it might be an engineer from a sibling team. Okay, so we do that based around product domains. Uh, they're chosen as a means to focus on customer outcomes and minimize cognitive load. Um, think of like a group of services with an established affinity with one another. So for example, one of the domain routes that John Lewis and Partners is for the fashion, electricals and add to basket services. It's known as the commercial journeys rotor. So unless things have drastically changed since um, I uh, left John Lewis, uh, right now, tonight, there'll be one engineer on call from those three or four teams for those three or four services. And finally, if a digital service has a high availability target and high demand, then there is a, um, a team that has to be on call for that service. So as Simon mentioned tomorrow, um, Sue Clutton and Stephen Chasink from uh, John Lewis and Partners and Equal Experts will talk about um, the cloud search service, and there is somebody on call tonight for that service from the cloud search team. Eventually, that cloud ser search team, they will see product demand start to slow down for their service. That's inevitable. When that does eventually happen, it will naturally fall back into a domain rotor, the natural domain rotor of that service. And then perhaps one day demand will increase, and then it might move back into a team rotor. So the key to all of this is that a minority of digital services need to have the highest availability target. Now, I'm sure we've all worked at companies or visited companies where everybody says that they're special and their service is 99.9 .9 or 99.99, .99, which probably isn't necessary. And I don't know, that everyone wants to have SRE or with the cool kids. But the key to all of this is kind of creating like an intermeshing system where you don't get to choose 99.9 .9 for yourself. It's all based off your revenue estimates from your product manager. OK, so let's move on to talk about um, our leading indicators. So to clarify our operability concerns, we want to get an idea of what's going to go wrong ahead of time. Simon, from the very outset of our work together, was very clear that trailing indicators were not enough. We wanted to get an idea of when teams were starting to head in a wrong direction, not when things were going bang. So we thought really deeply about the heuristics we can use to detect the presence of adaptive capacity for future problems and also identify the absence of adaptive capacity. So this is a screenshot of a bespoke service catalog that runs off JLDP. This is showing a bunch of services with their service level, their recent availability, and their leading indicators. There's an assessments column and a telemetry column. Um, there are more, but we've tried to keep it simple. So uh, and this is all a sortable list, so you can quickly see which services are in trouble, which are red, which are green, which are gray. So uh, let's talk about the telemetry column. So we have some leading indicators here that we've actually automated as checks. So JLDP, the digital platform, gives you a lot of alerts and dashboards out of the box. But we've observed at John Lewis and Partners that the teams that go a bit further and create their own alerts based off their own business rules tend to be in a better position to cope with incidents. So therefore, we flag up any services that don't have any of their own monitoring. 
And it's not um, you can't go live, it's not a you've got to fix this right now. It's just about uh, creating a little flag to say you know, this is something that needs to be considered at some point soon. And we also have an assessments column. This is not automated deliberately because we've created exploratory, open-ended questions for product teams to answer themselves. So once a quarter, teams have to fill in like an assessment that asks them some questions to think more deeply about their service. So one question would be, how do you handle an unexpected latency problem in a third-party dependency? So that's not a tick box exercise. That's for you to think about. You might create some tickets off that. You store them in the assessment file, which is machine readable. And then it winds up in the uh, catalog. Gray means that we haven't done an assessment for a while. Red means you've done an assessment and you've got some outstanding tasks to complete. And green means you've done an assessment and all tasks are finished. So this is one way of seeing ahead of time where problems might be occurring in our services. All right, and this is a screenshot of a service page. These are some trading indicators. You might know these from a book I did called Measuring Continuous Delivery. This is a graph of uh, lead time versus deployment. So what we're trying to see is how often teams are deploying and how fast it is. All of the deployment data from the digital platform is automated. And what we can do is we can look for like a slowdown in deployments as like a weak signal of inoperability because you're slowing down, which means releases will be larger, which gives you a greater chance of things going wrong. Now, obviously, this is, this is shallow data. It's not to be misused. It's not used to point fingers at people. Um, a decline in service availability, a slowdown in live deployments. They are suggestions that a product team has a story to share and perhaps needs some help. Okay, it's not where you get the story from, it's where you go to find the story. Simon, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you very much. So, one way we test operability proficiency is by running chaos days. So we want to identify digital services that may fail in production under certain conditions before the major incident actually happens. So this is a photo here from our head office and you'll see our platform product on the here playing back to my outcomes after a, a particular chaos test we did. This one was targeted at actually at the John Lewis digital platform itself. It was in a test environment. We're not that brave to uh, break the live uh, environment like maybe Netflix or somebody else might try. Yeah. Um, but what we have for that is we have uh, you know, team members acting as the agents of chaos. Um, and actually people really enjoy playing that role, trying to break things. Uh, it, 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 it's a really interesting thing to do. Um, and what we do is we ask the product teams to monitor their own services in, in that test environment and contact the plat platform team in our dedicated front door Slack channel if they see any issues. So we tend to run chaos days on something like a quarterly <coughs> basis. Uh, and what we do is we intentionally select the most experienced team members to be those in agents of chaos. The reason we do that is that if you leave them as the responders, they act as like a, a human run book. They are the ones that know, oh, I think it's that, I'll fix that. If you take that away, really test the team more as to whether that knowledge is shared across everybody in the team. Um, so it's really interesting to do that and cycle at which side of the, uh, the chaos test that you're on. And we've un uncovered plenty of kind of latent faults uh, in the past. Uh, one of the product teams didn't notice their whole database dis had disappeared. <laughs> it's a bit of a worry, really. Um, but you're doing it in a safe environment. You always can learn from it. As you do with a, an actual live instant, you, you know, this is creating a learning exercise. And we make sure that we capture those uh, lessons learned, we play them back, um, and we've observed those teams that respond to that and fix the faults pretty quickly after the chaos days, so they've prioritised that on their backlog, are less likely to endure painful uh, real incidents later on. Um, Another way we uh, validate uh, our operability is, is um, looking at uh, live load testing. So similar to chaos days, uh, we visualise key components of the website, use our knowledge and experience uh, and, and past history data to determine what load scenarios we're going to try. And usually that is, you know, test that peak of the Black Friday live, uh, live load um, and, and make sure that it, it, it all hangs together. So each individual product team still does their own load testing per digital service, but we still find it extremely valuable to have simulations of you know, customer browsing um, 
you know, and the interactions between those different components always pop up something new to, for us to tackle. So we normally run these live load tests, we do run those in the live environment. We run them overnight just to minimise the risk to our customers. Um, but we use real profiles of customer behaviour, so we record that during the day or during a period, and then we skew that and play it back at an accelerated rate to simulate our Black Friday traffic. Um, and we inject that into the live website. We then, as well as the, the, the team that, that manages that, our Sonic testing team, um, they help doing some of the overall analysis, but we expect each of those product teams on the platform to also do analysis of the behaviours of their services as well and to look at where they can improve their own digital services. This obviously protects our Black Friday capacity. Something a bit different here, but we also take the professional development of our partners, our employees, very seriously too. After all, we're all co-owners in our business. So from the very outset of our digital journey, we are ensured that partners have opportunities to learn new skills and move into new roles. So partner engineers can embark on a number of different learning pathways. We've designed one that's specific to operability. It covers topics such as agile operations, security testing, performance, learning from incidents and more. We mentioned earlier uh, that we used to have a central operations support team and that was mostly staffed by third party managed service but also uh, a small number of partners in my team as well. But those partners have invaluable skills and knowledge to be, and experience to be able to share. So as we wind down that ops support team and we reduce that managed service, those partners are gradually moving into the product teams, into the platform team itself, to share their operational wisdom and learn new skills. Simon? Yes. If I could just add something there. Okay. Who here has ever worked in an IT company where you're told that your professional development is really important and yet it turns out that it's not important to the company. <laughs> okay. All the John Lewis people in the crowd are now looking at you thinking, why have you got your hands up? <laughs> so I, I must say that it's the most rare thing. I've, it's the only time I've ever seen it takes it really seriously. It's amazing to see. Thank you. So I think I am going to hand back to you. Oh, it's actually Steve. me now. Oh. So, you know, <laughs> so I didn't have to interrupt. Steve. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> How many other companies would say, let's make the best use of our operations team knowledge and move them into the checkout team? It's just a great to see. Okay, so let's talk about some outcomes. So these are some graphs about deployment throughput um, on John Lewis Digital Services. So the graph on the left uh, is showing monthly uh, deployments for all digital services. And you can see that over the last two years, um, it's, got, it's averaged between 200 deploys a month and 600 deploys a month. Uh, the eagle eyed amongst you, uh, we'll see a bit of a dip here around January 2020. Anybody like to guess what that dip was? Around November? Yep, so there was a... Thank you, uh, knowledgeable person at the back. Yes, so there was a change freeze then for all digital services and all monoliths. There is no such dip um, again after that because that was the last year where the change freeze applied to digital services and monoliths. After 2020, the entire IT department was comfortable with lifting digital services out of the well-established partnership-wide change management process around Black Friday, which is a testament to the approach to operability as well as throughput, I believe. Now, the graph on the right here, this is part of the service catalogue again, and this is showing a couple of different measures that are really important on JLDP. It shows the time it takes to onboard a new service. That's from service creation to uh, first live deploy, and live to customers is time from service creation to your first, you know, 1% of live traffic. Uh, the average time scale to first live customer is now 90 days. It used to be, I think, six months when I joined John Lewis, and it's coming in some services now reaching 1% live traffic in under a week, and they create additional millions per year in incremental revenue as a result. The time to provision a new digital service has come down to one day, that, and I mean that is one day from I would like to create a new digital service, please, platform team, to I have something deployed in production, ready for live traffic. OK, so this is about service reliability. Uh, this is my favorite slide. So uh, the graph on the left here shows major incidents per month for the past two years. And you will see red is monolith incidents and blue is digital service incidents. And you will see that the number, we don't go above four incidents a month. And even that is unusual. And by a major incident, a P1, P2, we mean something where John Lewis was clearly losing money as a result of some uh, service unavailability somewhere. 
So that's very low. OK, and then on the right, we've got time to restore. That's the time from the start of an incident to the time of the end of the incident, as we've marked it in service now. And you can see that red is monoliths, blue is digital services. The um, time to restore for digital services is markedly lower than the time for monoliths, which can get up to around three hours in some cases. For digital services, it's rarely above an hour, only once there. But you can see in both cases, there's a steady downwards trend, which is really great to see. So I think that's a great sign of the improvements being made to digital services are bleeding into the monolith space, the operations team and product teams working together to improve reliability across the board. And there's certainly been a cross-pollination of knowledge, which is great. OK, uh, this table is the most recent analysis of the multifaceted value of the hybrid operating model for JohnLewis.com. This covers April 2019 to April 2021. This is showing how Ops Run It and You Build It, You Run It work together. So You Build It, You Run It is covered at the top. That's for the uh, digital services that make up components of the JohnLewis.com website. And underneath, we've got the third party managed service, which is covering the monoliths that still comprise parts of the website. And this data shows how successful um, You Build It, You Run It has been as an insurance policy for business outcomes. It's resulted in a deployment frequency of every two to three days, despite us climbing from 28 services to 44 services, from 22 teams to 29 teams. I'd also ask that you note that the number of on-call rotors is much lower than the number of teams. Again, number of teams, number of people does not have to mean number of people on-call. Uh, we've got fewer incidents here, only four or three in a year. The time to acknowledge an incident is under two minutes. The time to restore is around 44 minutes. It's now down to 27 minutes. And revenue protection effectiveness is in the po net positive, and it's quite high. Now, revenue protection effectiveness is a measure that um, we've cooked up. And the way that we look at it is it's the percentage of expected revenue loss per incident that you actually protect by having a faster than expected time to restore. So for example, you might remember that a critical service, um, the highest availability service, would have a 99.9% .9 availability target, and that permits 43 minutes of downtime. If you have a faster incident resolution than 43 minutes, then you are increasing your revenue protection effectiveness, because that amount of expected revenue loss, some of it's actually been saved by you moving faster than 43 minutes. So with the third party managed service, a lower number of services, although they're really big, chunky services, the big monoliths, a lower number of teams, one ops rotor in both cases, they are running at weekly deploys, which is pretty good considering how complicated those monoliths are, but there's no chance to go any faster. There really isn't. We've tried it before. Uh, they've got a higher number of incidents. Their time to acknowledge is high. You might remember with the instant notification workflow slide, I talked about the time it takes to go through spreadsheets and find the right person. But that has improved massively over the last year, which is great. And the time to restore on average was two hours. That's now come down to one hour. And revenue protection effectiveness has also improved. So we can say with confidence here that embedding operability into digital teams at scale, including you build it, you run it, has contributed to faster incident resolution time and more effective revenue protection, not just for digital services, but it's also had a positive impact on the older ways of working as well. OK, back to you, Simon. Thank you, Steve. Um, so what kind of speed and agility, what, what does that allow us to deliver for our customers, which is obviously the most important thing? So picking one example here, which was actually pre-COVID, but this was the first beta trial we did on JohnLewis.com. Uh, and we wanted to try and help the uh, experience, improve the experience for choosing the right sofa. So for an on online retailer, it's not very easy to gather feedback from your customers directly. But we have the advantage of being able to tap into the vast experience of our shop uh, floor selling partners. So after putting the first iteration live on the website, some of the team went out to visit the shops to gather feedback. Now the shop floor partners are mostly used to IT being multi-year projects rolling out you know, new EPOS tills or HR systems. So they were absolutely amazed when the team went out, got their feedback in the morning, fed it back to the, back to the product team. They implemented those changes live within the same day and showed them back to the partners and they went, how, how is this? It's magic. Um, and, and that's brilliant. I mean, you can't always do that, but, but that's fantastic and that's what we're trying to strive for. 
However, over on the right, some of you may have seen this earlier in the year, we cannot keep all of our customers happy. Boris Johnson's partner, or wife now, wife. has been replaced, wife. wife now, it was partner at the time, but <laughs> was replacing Theresa May's John Lewis furniture and decorations with her £800 a roll gold wallpaper, so we're not going to please everybody all of the time. Um, so we're going to bro uh, draw the presentation to a close now and look at some of the challenges we're still working on. Um, one of those is how do we achieve the best value support model? One of the things Steve's talked about is that domain model. Sometimes teams are so um, focused on wanting to support their own service, they're less inclined to want to support others in the domain. So it's a negotiation that we continue to have. How do you safely remove your reliance on having a 24 by 7 eyes on managed service? And, and we're working through that and weaning ourselves out of that at the moment. <coughs> and of course, the ongoing challenge of evolving service management and getting them to become more agile, uh, that's a, a, a continued battle. Um, so, how do you embed operability at scale in a 150-year-old enterprise organisation? Well, this is our takeaways here. We'd recommend test, learn, and continually evolve your operating model. Think about operability as early as possible to ensure what you're creating is something that's sustainable for continuous delivery. Maintain the visibility of operability with both leading and trailing indicators to keep yourselves on track. Encourage little and often deployments wherever possible to increase agility and reduce the blast radius of deployment issues or defects. And adopt, you build it, you run it for all your product teams to maximise operability incentives and to create a cost effective insurance for the business outcome. So that's the end of our presentation, and I've just put a few links up here uh, for other uh, blogs and videos from others in the team, uh, and also a link to our recruiting website if anybody's interested, if we've inspired anybody. Uh, Steve and I appreciate you uh, listening and spending the time with us. Uh, I don't think we have time for questions, but please catch us uh, at any point on the beach, yeah. on the boat, anytime. Or, yeah. On uh, Slack or on the beach. On Slack. Uh, after we've had a few beers, our answers will be more interesting, yep. I'm sure. Yep. Thank you very much.